Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Papa Boris, and in this video, I'm going to teach you how to play Harold, or Harald, or Harald, however it's called. This is a game that you've probably never heard of because it's not a particularly famous game. I wanted to make a video about it though because it occupies a really rare niche in board gaming, and that is the heavy filler. Now, a filler game is a game that can be played in 30 minutes or less and has rules that are pretty quick to explain. So you can play it like, you know, at the end of a game night when people are too tired to play a whole nother board game or it's too late, but like a filler will just do the trick. Or at the beginning of a session or while you're waiting for people to come or something. And the thing is, most fillers are pretty light. They are relatively low on strategy, where sure, on average, a strategic player will beat one who doesn't know what they're doing but luck plays a really big role. What I like about Herald is that even though it is a card game and luck is an element, it really feels when you play like the game is decided by skill. And when you first play the game, it's actually kind of overwhelming because it's like, okay, well, the rules all make sense. Oh shit, what the hell do I do on my turn? I have no idea what's going on. So it's a meaty game. It's a gamer's game, but it is a filler, which you don't really see a whole lot of. Now, to help me teach the game, I am using the $5 app that just came out on Steam. It's a decently made app. I don't find that this game has a particularly great amount of value as an app in the first place. It's like nothing nothing against the app. I just don't think this game needs to be made into an app. I don't know why it was. Uh, maybe the publisher, As Asmodee, was hoping to cash in on the Armello vibe. I'm not sure. Like, there's animals. It's got that kind of graphic art style. It has nothing whatsoever in relation to Armello. They're totally different games. But anyway, if you like this game, I would recommend just buying the game. I, I don't think that the app is really worth it unless you just, you know, don't care about losing $5. And this app does have, you know, a tutorial, it does have the rules, it does have a hard AI, you can play against people online, but hopefully when you watch this video, you'll get a sense of whether you like the game or not from my explanation of the rules. And then if you like the game, I would recommend just buying the game. Anyway, let's go ahead and start against one AI player. This game is best played either one-on-one -on -one or three-player. With four players, it's better to play in teams, which definitely changes things a lot. I'm just gonna go against uh, one AI, which is a, is a strength of this game, by the way, that it's really quite good to player. Maybe even that's the best way to play it. So if you have like one partner in your life and you have a hard time finding good two-player games, this one's, this one's a nice one to have in your collection. I'm not gonna have the expansion here. Here's my nickname, Papa Boris. We're not gonna turn on hard mode because I lose to the AI on easy because it is a hard game. Let's go ahead and start playing. So in this game, what happens is you get dealt a hand of five cards, and basically the cards are all one of six different characters. Each character is both an animal and a profession. You can really just use one or the other. So you can just talk about the boar, the bear, the lynx, and so on, or you can talk about the blacksmith, the warrior, the merchant, and so on, or you can just say both, both times. But anyway, uh, you pick one of the five cards in your hand to go into your village. I'm gonna go ahead and pick the boar. And please note that this is not gonna be expert play. I might even lose. The point of this video when I do the gameplay is just to show you the mechanics and some of the sorts of decision-making you can do, not necessarily to make good decisions. So we're gonna put that in the village. Now, once each player has decided who to put in their village, the game begins. Now, on your turn, it's really simple. You have a hand of four cards. You put one of them into the council in the middle of the board, and you put one of them into your village. Now, the way that this works is the cards that go to the council, they just go in there and they sit. But if you put a card into your village, it, it can have an effect. And the effect is optional. You don't have to use it if you don't want to, but you can. And so each of the six characters in the game has a different effect when it is played to your village. When the cards are in the middle, they're all basically the same. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a warrior into my into the city council. And then I'm gonna go ahead and also add a warrior to my village. Now, let's talk about some of the effects of the different cards in this game. So when you put a blacksmith into your village, you can flip two cards face down. And the two cards have to be in different playing areas. So you can put like a card face down in your village and in the council. Or you can flip a card face down from the council and your opponent's village. A card that is flipped face down has no effect. Um, the warrior's ability is you pick a card from a village, either yours or your opponent's, you put it to the bottom of the deck, and then you replace it with a new card from the top of the deck. 
So I'm going to do that just to illustrate. It's not necessarily a good move, but I'm going to play that, and then I'm going to go ahead and take my opponent's bard here and move it to the bottom of the deck, and they're going to get a random replacement. Speaking of bards, the bard's effect is that you can swap a card from your hand with a card in the village. So you basically get to take a card that is already in your village, put it back into your hand, and take a card from your hand and put it into your village. So I'm going to go ahead and confirm this. And that went to the bottom of the deck, and my opponent drew a goat, which is a seafarer. So the goat's effect is that you can swap a card from a village with a card from the council. They can be in your village or your opponent's village. And I think the only card left that we need to talk about here is this guy, the merchant. So the merchant's effect is that you swap a card from your that is in your village with your opponent's village. Now this right away kind of gives you a hint of like why this is definitely a gamer's game because there's six different effects for each of the characters and while six is not that big of a number they're all kind of similar the, you can see pretty much all of them have something to do with swapping and there's like subtle differences like swap from your village and an opponent's village or swap from any village and the council or flip things in, a, in one place and another place, or put something away and then get a replacement. So a lot of it moves cards around, but in slightly different ways. So you have to remember those things quite precisely if you're gonna obviously be a good player. The other thing about this game is the scoring. So let's talk about how the game ends and how the game is scored. The game ends after you get uh, 10 cards in your village in a two-player game. If it's a three-player game, it's eight, and if it's a four-player game, it's six. So each time you add a card to your village, um, that is kind of like a clock. It helps you remember uh, how many turns are left. So we've added two cards to the village so far. That means that there's, you know, eight turns left. After you put the final card into your village, you immediately score your village, meaning that after you play the final card, your opponent's cannot stop you from scoring the points that you think that you have. And then at the end of the game, after the last player has made their last turn, whoever has the most points wins. So there's two main ways of getting points in this game. One way is sort of the default way for everything, and then the other way is card specific. The default way is very straightforward. Each card in your village is worth a number of points equal to the number of that card that is in the council. So for example, right now there is one warrior in the king's council, which means that my warrior is worth one point. Right now, there are no blacksmiths in the council, which means that my blacksmith is worth zero points. So the more of a certain card to go in the council, and the more of it correspondingly that you have in your village, the more points that you'll get. That's what this number represents, by the way, is one, because uh, I'm getting currently one point for matching my cards to what is in the city council. Then every different character has a different way of scoring bonus points. So let's talk about those. Blacksmiths score you a maximum of four points, if you simply have more warriors than blacksmiths in the village. So it doesn't matter how many blacksmiths you have, but as long as you have at least one, you're going to get four points as long as they are outnumbered by the warriors. Warriors give you one point per bard. Bards give you four points if there are more bards than merchants. And I'll actually go ahead and draw a bard to my hand. Uh, merchants give you one point per seafarer. Seafarers give you four points if the number of seafarers is equal to the number of scouts. And we have not seen a scout yet, actually, so I haven't even talked about the scout's power. I beg your pardon. Um, I definitely need to do that. Hopefully a scout comes along at some point. So when a scout comes along, I'm going to go ahead and explain the scout's power um, and uh, how the scouts score points. But um, you'll notice at the end of my turn, I drew two cards from this reserve. This is similar to Ticket to Ride. At the end of your turn, you draw two cards. You can draw from this face-up area, or you can draw randomly from the deck. So now it's the second turn, and I gotta go ahead and play a card to the council and put a card into my village. My opponent switched my warrior with this seafarer, which sort of pissed me off. But, uh, you know, what are you gonna do? So I'm gonna go ahead and put another seafarer into the middle, because that will make my own seafarer be worth a point. I'm not saying, by the way, that this is a great play. It's just a play you can make. I'm also gonna go ahead and uh, put my links into my council. Now, I am actually going to give my opponent this blacksmith, and I'm going to swap it with my opponent's merchant. Now, the reason for that is that the merchants give me points per seafarer, so each merchant is worth one point because I have a seafarer in my village. Each merchant's also worth one point because there is a merchant in the middle. However, there are currently no blacksmiths in the middle, so the blacksmith wasn't worth as much points as I imagine that this merchant will be worth. 
Okay, so that's kind of, again, uh, this is just an example of how you could go about thinking. This is not necessarily a good strategy by any means, but that's the sort of thing that you have to do as you play this game. Now, we draw, we draw cards. I'm going to actually draw from the deck just to try to get a scout so I can talk about scouts. Hey, there we go. Okay. So when you play a scout, what it does is it gives you the power of the card that you sent to the council. Unless that card is a scout, in which case it does nothing. At the end of the game, scouts give you two points for every face down card in your village. It's a little bit crap because usually a card is worth more than two points, but scouts can make up for having some of your cards flipped by blacksmiths. Um, and you can also strategically flip your own cards. If you want to, for example, flip uh, a merchant, or a, sorry, a, a seafarer, in order to bring your seafarers and scouts back down to the same number, then that can give you the four point bonus from the seafarers of having the scouts and the seafarers be the same. And it can also give you a bonus for having scouts because scouts count two points per card. So like there's these multiple layers of thinking that you can do. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a merchant so that I can add it, hello, there we go. So I can add it to uh, the council next time and um, start getting some points. Okay, so my opponent just turned uh, he played a blacksmith and he turned the seafarer and the seafarer in my hand face down. So I lost a whole bunch of points from that, which is super duper annoying. So what I'm going to do to try to counteract this problem is play a merchant to the council. And then I'm going to play a bard to my village. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this goat um, with another merchant from my hand. And so now this goat can be replayed later so I can counteract the fact that it was flipped and I got an extra merchant into my into my council so now each merchant is worth two points and I've got three of them so it's a lot of points. I'm gonna go ahead and grab another merchant so I can potentially play it into the middle here. I am also going to take a blacksmith. My opponent played a blacksmith to the middle so I'm thinking let's cash in on some of this blacksmith goodness. If I can play that I'll get a point for the blacksmith and if I can then play a couple of warriors I can get those four bonus points. Okay so now my opponent uh, increased the number of warriors in the council so now warriors are pretty valuable. Unfortunately I don't have any warriors um, but what I can do is I can play a blacksmith Oh no, I didn't want to do that! Oh god, I wanted to play the blacksmith to my village. Whoops! Uh, that was a big mistake. So I just gave my opponent two points for adding an extra blacksmith to the village. I needed to... Frick. Oh, that was that was really stupid. Okay, well, let's change strategies then. I'm gonna go ahead and play a scout to my village. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna flip one of these blacksmiths in the middle and a blacksmith in my opponent's place because I want those to be worth less points. I'm going to grab a couple of these warriors. I'm still hoping I can get a blacksmith at some point and then play two warriors and get those four points for the blacksmith. Okay, so my opponent shuffled away his flipped card with a warrior. Okay, so now let's see. My opponent's got like one of everything going on here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to stick to my strategy. I'm going to go ahead and add a uh, lynx to the middle to make my own lynxes worth more points. And then I'm going to add a warrior. Now, I can at this point choose one of my cards or one of, one of my opponent's cards to send away to the bottom of the deck and get a random replacement. I don't really see much point in doing that, so I'm going to skip that. It is optional. I'm just not going to do it. Now I'm going to take a blacksmith so I can put another blacksmith in my village. And I've already got another warrior, so I don't need those. So what I'm going to do here is grab a bard. I like using bards in case my opponent flipped my stuff. I can unflip it with the bard and put it back into my hand. Okay, my opponent put a goat into the middle. Now there's two of them, you can see, and he, and he collected a goat. So that's fine. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put... Uh, i got to put something in the middle. Hmm, I don't want to put the warrior in the middle because I want to play the warrior. I don't want to put the blacksmith in the middle because I want to play the blacksmith. I actually want to play all of my cards. So I guess what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this bard. It doesn't hurt my opponent, or it doesn't help my opponent more than me because we each have just a single bard. Now what I'm going to do is play the... Seafarer, I think. Yeah, let's do this. So what I'm going to do here is think about whether I want to swap something with the council. And I think the answer is yes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give my opponent the scout. And I'm going to put this goat into the middle. So now there's three goats here so my goat is worth three points but my opponent doesn't have any goats at all so I made a big point swing 
by increasing my own goats relative to my opponents. Uh, it's time to draw cards. At the end of my turn, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this goat to stop my opponent from getting goats. I don't know if that's a good strategy or not, but I'm going to do it, so, huh? And then I guess I'm going to just draw a card from the deck. Got a blacksmith, which I'm not super excited about. Because my opponent played a goat to the middle, and the reason he did that was because he stole my goat. Okay, with a, with a merchant. All right, so that kind of sucks. So now I've got two scouts, which I don't really want. Um, okay, let's do this. I'm gonna play a blacksmith to the middle, and then I'm gonna also play a blacksmith to my council. So what I'm gonna do here is flip my opponent's um, merchant face down, because that's worth three points. So that's nice. And then I'm also going to, I have to flip something else as well. I'm actually gonna flip one of my own scouts. So I don't want two scouts, I just want one. And uh, that way I can play a goat later and I'll have one scout and one goat. And then I'm gonna be goat to go. <laughs> okay. So I don't want bards or warriors, um, I don't think. So, well, maybe I'll take a bard. Sure, just to see what happens. Okay, so my opponent added a scout to the middle. And then he played a warrior, and he switched away my face-down scout, uh, and I got another scout. So now it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to get my scouts and my goats to match up. Well, here I think we have a pretty straightforward decision. I'm going to go ahead and put my warrior in the middle, because I have one warrior, and um, I want it to be worth more points. And then I'm going to play my other warrior down. So now I have more warriors than blacksmiths, and they're worth a bunch of points. What I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to shuffle away my opponent's warrior. The reason for that is I don't want him to have more warriors than blacksmiths, and I also don't want him to have a card that's just worth three points straight up. So this is great. He actually drew another blacksmith from the top. So now he has more blacksmiths than warriors, so it's going to be hard for him to get that four-point bonus. Now here, I'm going to take another warrior just in case my opponent messes with my warrior count. And I'm going to take another merchant too because they're just worth three points and they're good to have. Okay, my opponent played a blacksmith in the middle and played a scout, and he's going to flip some shit. All right. Well, this is actually okay. See, we're at three, five, six, seven, eight. So we're getting close to the end of the game. That's fine. Um, I'm gonna play a warrior to the middle because I have more of them than my opponent. So increasing their value is better for me than it is for my opponent. And I'm also uh, going to play a goat. Now I can swap a card from a village with a card in a council. So what I'm gonna do here is put one of my opponent's goats into the middle and I'm gonna give my opponent a scout. So now my opponent has a lot more scouts than goats so he's gonna have to work to get those to balance out to get those four points and I also increase the value of my own goat. Now, I've already got a bard, I don't want more bards so at the end of my turn I'm gonna just take random cards from the deck. This often happens a lot, I'm not a super big fan that it tends to just concentrate the same type of card over and over. Um, but, you know, it's a minor quibble, certainly. All right, so here's the last turn. So I get to play one more card. Now, it's very important to note that when you play your last card, you score immediately after playing it, so your opponent cannot stop you from getting some points. So that's I think that's a good feature. It, it prevents the game from feeling unfair. So what I'm going to do here is keep it real simple. My opponent doesn't have any merchants. I have three of them, so definitely adding a merchant to the middle increases... Oh, Jesus, no, I'm terrible at this... I'm terrible. In your last turn, you do not put anything in the middle. It goes right into your village. So I should have put a goat in because um, when you put in a goat, it would then make my scouts and my goats be the same. Um, this was actually really, really quite foolish. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I guess we're going to try to make the most of it. I'm going to um, steal one of my opponent's goats and I'm going to give them a... Bard, I guess, because bards are only worth a point. So now I end up with the same number of seafarers as scouts. And it was locked in, so even though my opponent ended up stopping that from happening, uh, it, it, I still got the points. All right, now, the, the game here is going to automatically calculate stuff. I'm going to go over this so you can see exactly like where all this scoring stuff comes from. Um, and so, yeah, you can see why this is what I call a heavy filler. Um, it is really quite complicated, not only making decisions on a turn-to-turn -turn basis, but also, like, calculating the score. So let's talk about it.
Um, blacksmiths give you four points if you have more blacksmiths, or say if you have more warriors than blacksmiths. I got four points for that because I had more warriors than blacksmiths, but my opponent didn't. The reason that I got three points here is that there were three in the middle, and I had one blacksmith in my council, and each card in your council is worth the number of that card that are in the middle. So that's why I got three. My opponent had two of them, so he got six. For the warriors, both of us got eight, um, but my opponent managed to get a bonus that I did not, which is um, having bards. These are worth one point per bard, and my opponent had a bunch of them. Um, however, that's fine. So I didn't get any bards in, my, in the end, so I got no points here. I had no bards, so no points for bards. Um, the bards give you four points if you have more bards than merchant, which, which my opponent did. I got a bunch of points for merchants just because merchants were worth a lot, and I also got uh, four points because you get one point per seafarer, which I had a decent number of. Seafarers give you a four point bonus if you have the same number of seafarers as scouts, which I did. And then finally, the scouts weren't worth very much inherently at the end of the game, but they give you two points per face down card, and I had a couple of face down cards, and my opponent had, uh, or sorry, I guess I had, um, did I really have two face down cards? I guess I did. And my opponent also, I think, had two face down cards. So in the end, I narrowly edged out the easy AI. All right, um, can I, does, will the game actually let me see the board? This is one thing with the app. I feel like when you, oh yeah, there it goes. So you can still see the board. I maybe should have had this out while I was explaining the score. So you can see like one point for the blacksmith because there's three in the middle, two points for the warriors because there's four in the middle and so on. And I guess I did have a bard. So I guess I should have got a point for that. I don't know. Anyway, the point is that's Harold. So I hope you enjoyed it. I will play a couple more games of Harold against the AI on this channel so you can see more of how the gameplay pans out. And um, if you like the game, I hope you'll support it by buying a physical copy or if you, Want to get the $5 version of Steam? It's not bad for a little bit of a romp. I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for watching.